Is politics hurting the battle against COVID-19? And an international virus expert discusses the Delta variant threat. Hello, I'm Mike Walter filling in for Anna Naidu, and this is The Heat. It is a new month, but it's also a familiar story as COVID-19 continues to rage across the globe, leaving over 4,250,000 people dead. Later in the show, we will hear from Dr. William Hazeltine, who is a virus expert. But first, we ask if politics is undermining global efforts to fight the deadly disease. From the origins of the virus and allegations over a lab leak in Wuhan, the United States continues to question China's role and Beijing has pushed back hard on that. China says the novel coronavirus origin tracing work should be treated as a scientific issue rather than a political one. To talk about this, I'm joined by Deborah Seligson. She served as the U.S. State Department's Environment, Science, Technology, and Health Counselor at the U.S. Embassy in Beijing from 2003 to 2007. And she is now an Assistant Professor of Political Science at Villanova University, where she currently teaches a course on pandemics and politics. Professor Seligson, uh, thanks so much for talking to us. I want to start by asking you about the origins of the virus. As you know, there's a lot of politicians here in the United States who are uh, positing this theory that somehow it escaped from the uh, Wuhan Institute of Virology. China, of course, has denied the lab leak. Uh, and, and when you talk to noted epidemiologists, at least when they're not on camera, they kind of roll their eyes. A lot of them uh, feel like the, the possibility of that, very rare. But I want to get your thoughts. Where do you think the virus started? And, and what are your thoughts about this lab leak theory? So I'm not an epidemiologist or a virologist. So I just listen to virologists on this. And most of them are quite open and in public. I mean, you can go on Twitter. You can read academic papers. You can listen to the podcast This Week in Virology. And they're all pretty clear that they think it's the least likely origin, that the more likely origin is a human-animal interface that's most likely related to animal husbandry, the, whether that's um, fur farming or the raising of wild animals for food. So, um, you know, I just follow what they say. I don't try to develop my own theory. I would note this isn't a theory. It isn't even really a hypothesis. It's more like an allegation because it's not actually based on any material information. So, I just follow the virologists. There is politics involved. As you know, uh, former President uh, Donald Trump really pushed this lab leak theory. Uh, President Biden, the Biden administration, says that they are conducting an intelligence review. Is there a danger of this becoming too politicized? And, and what are the dangers of that? So I already think it has become too politicized. My suspicion is that the Biden administration was trying to depoliticize it by doing this um, intelligence review. Unusually, when they announced the review, they also pointed out that only three of the many intelligence agencies in the United States actually even had an opinion on whether this was a likely outcome, and two out of those three said no. And all of them said that they had low confidence in the data they had. So they were pretty open about the fact that they didn't have a lot to go on. And I think they were trying to quell this to some extent. But the damage caused by it becoming politicized, which it already is, is that I think it's really hampered international health cooperation with China. And I know the most about U.S.-China health cooperation, but we can see it's damaging the WHO relationship with China. And we really need to be working with China right now. We need to be working together to vaccinate the world. And we need to be working together to monitor and prepare for and try to prevent the next pandemic, because this isn't the last pandemic that we're going to face. I want to go where you're going. Before I do, I want to touch on the politicians again, because this week, House Republicans released their own report. They claim they have evidence the virus uh, 
that caused the pandemic was leaked from the Chinese research facility of, uh, the, of course, Wuhan Institute of Virology. But according to reports, as you pointed out, uh, U.S. intelligence reports, you know, as, as you were clear, you know, two of them like no, and, and the third kind of, you know, no conclusion. How do you view this latest development where, you know, these stories keep coming out, they get print, um, and yet it doesn't matter how many times you swap back at it, uh, it's it still got legs somehow. You know, it, it's, it's frustrating because I really think we're wasting our time and we're re wasting resources. We've made it more difficult for Chinese scientists to actually do important coronavirus research. We've cut off ties between U.S. and Chinese scientists on this topic. You know, and one, of, one of the things NIH did was cut the funding for coronavirus data collection during this pandemic. We need to know a lot more about coronaviruses. You know, this is the third one to emerge in this century. And two of the three emerged in China, but one emerged in the Middle East. We know that these are prevalent throughout, you know, Asia and the Middle East in terms of the range of these viruses, and I don't know, maybe further. But this is clearly a major danger. And instead, we're focusing on a very unlikely source. and. The basic misconception that all of this started with was that this Wuhan Institute of Virology is near the market where COVID was first identified. So firstly, it isn't. It's on the other side of a very large river. And secondly, there's now paper, you know, academic peer-reviewed papers showing that this emerged in multiple markets. And the fact that it emerged in multiple markets is even more suggestive of, you know, some animal raising source of this virus, that some, you know, some farm shipped to a bunch of markets, that kind of thing. So, yeah, it's just very harmful. But how do you defeat the rumor? I have no idea. Well, let's go there because we've talked a lot about the politicians. I think the scientists should get equal time. Um, one of them, Australian microbiologist, infectious disease specialist, Dominic Dwyer, was part of the Wuhan uh, team. He, he went to Wuhan. He's written about it. Uh, he said, you know, th this was the most politically sensitive option, but also extremely rare, rare that it would escape the lab. Uh, he concluded that it was extremely unlikely. He says they went to the facility, they spoke to the staff, they checked, they learned that the scientists took blood samples, they looked for antibodies, they weren't there. They said that they looked at biosecurity audits, no evidence. They kept chasing the evidence, there was no evidence. And Peter Dossack, who's another team member, says that's what you do. You look at the evidence, you come to a conclusion, there was no evidence. Both of these members of the Wuhan team, very frustrated, annoyed, a, that people aren't listening to them, B, that they're not re reading their report, and C, the most annoying, is that somehow how do you compete with social media, with the conspiracy theorists, somehow the misinformation uh, trumps information. And I want to get your thoughts on that. Well, I mean, there's a lot of research on that as well, right, that denying um, rumors only fuels them, that people don't actually remember the denial, you know, tons of research in political science and sociology on how these things happen. Um, but, you know, we're awash in um, misinformation, misinformation about vaccines, misinformation about the virus. Uh, you know, especially in the United States, this has become just so politicized. Uh, and, you know, the other thing is there's this assumption that somehow these virologists don't know much about how science is done in China and they don't understand the Chinese system. And that's completely wrong because they actually go to China quite a bit. If you work on coronaviruses, you have to go to China. You have to work with Chinese scientists because that's where the pathogen is. And so a number of these scientists actually have years and years of experience and know the quality of the work being done in China. They know the dramatic improvements in the quality of 
both the education of the scientists and the facilities that they're working in over the last 20 years. You know, they understand the sort of physical infrastructure, the way cities work, the way markets work, because they've actually spent a lot of time in these places. This now gets them accused of conflict of interest or something else, but what I would call it is expertise. And that close collaboration is so important, and this kind of argument drives a wedge into that uh, close collaboration. I mean, I've talked to epidemiologists, and, and as you point out, you know, they, they kind of have to say the, the politically correct thing, which is, oh, investigations aren't a bad thing, even though they know this is pretty much a foregone conclusion, this is not what happened. But it also really impacts this relationship between these scientists when we really need it, right? Right. So that's the key point. I mean, if people do want to know the origin of the virus in detail, and the truth is we may or may not ever know. The reality with Ebola is they surmise it comes from bats, but what the intermediate species is, they don't know. With SARS, kind of the opposite situation where they figured out the intermediate species relatively early, but it took 14 years to figure out the bat origin of SARS. So it, it first of all, can take a long time, but second of all, you want samples collected and things studied as quickly as you can because often this intermediate species dies out and then there's no evidence, right? So all of this time spent on it and how this has become a political hot potato in China has made it less likely that we're going to find out the origin. It would be useful to find out the origins because it's going to help us better understand the pathway that the next such pathogen might take. But it's not the only thing. We've got to be just looking much more broadly at these coronaviruses, where they're emerging, where the risk is. And then we have this immediate need to vaccinate the world. The U.S. is not producing enough vaccine to do it ourselves. We've said we're partnering with India, even with the vaccine, if India can actually supply it, and that's not clear because of domestic demand, but even if they supply what's promised, that only gets you to another 500 million people because they've said a billion doses. We have 7.8 billion people in the world to vaccinate. We're going to need Chinese vaccine, and it makes far more sense to work collaboratively to study where it's most effective, how it's most effective, to do more research on whether using two different vaccines works better, all this kind of stuff to make sure that we're getting as much of the world vaccinated as quickly as possible, because we don't get back to normal until everyone gets back to normal. But even there, uh, efforts by China to get their vaccines out to other countries, uh, they're accused of vaccine diplomacy. Um, again, more political sniping rather than scientific uh, research. It's more like, oh, they're only doing this because of that. And to your point, I think China recognizes, you know, as do other countries, what you just said. Nobody's safe until everybody's safe. Right. Well, I mean, the U.S. says it's doing vaccine diplomacy, too, right? They, they have this agreement with the Quad, Japan, India, Australia, and the U.S. to do vaccines outreach together, both, I mean, and I will say both the U.S. and China are also members of COVAX, which is this global effort to distribute vaccines. But that's distributed a um, hundred some odd million doses right now, and we need billions and billions. So um, I think, you know, all countries recognize that there's some advantage to giving vaccine in terms of its diplomatic benefit. But so I don't know what accusing one another of it make. I mean, it, it seems meaningless. What I think we need is more vaccine diplomacy. We need to actually be talking to the Chinese about how to best coordinate our distribution.
Deborah, before you go, I have one more quick question, and if you can respond quickly, that'd be great. I, I want to ask you about an op-ed piece you wrote in the Washington Post. Uh, it was last February, and it's because the first sentence and the last sentence just jump out at me. The first sentence you wrote, if you focus only on economics and forget public health, you risk sacrificing both, which I think is a really good point. And then you go on to close the piece by writing, new infections are going to arise. We neglect the lessons learned from previous epidemics at our peril. Talk to me about that. Well, you know, we learned a lot about how to cooperate with China during SARS, and then we cut off that cooperation during the Trump administration. I mean, we also had just learned a lot about the likelihood of pandemics. Both President Bush and President Obama spoke about that quite eloquently. And our failure to learn those lessons is a real problem, and I think we're doing it again, because we can't be continuously fighting about the past. We have to be thinking about how do we get out of this mess now, which is about vaccination, and how do we prepare for the next pandemic, which involves a lot of you know equipment and development and stuff in the United States, but it also is about developing a global surveillance system for new diseases like we have for influenza. We have worked together with the Chinese for decades on influenza, and it's a great cooperative relationship. We can have that kind of relationship on other diseases. Deborah Sullickson, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Now we turn to some of the latest developments in the fight against COVID-19. Joining me from Connecticut is Dr. William Hazeltine, a former professor at Harvard Medical School. He is a virus expert, and he is also the chairman and president of Access Health International. Uh, William, why don't we start with uh, just kind of the subject that we were just talking about, cooperation and collaboration. It, it's vitally important. Uh, this is a global pandemic. It's going to be all hands on deck, isn't it? And, and you've got a, a method that you're espousing. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, well, first of all, science is and has been always a collaborative effort, and it proceeds best when people are not impeded by national borders. Uh, until we've had a great cooperation uh, in scientific publications uh, all over the world. You know, we got a world got a rapid head start with the publication from China for the sequence of the virus. That's one of the reasons we have potent vaccines uh, so quickly. And we've got to keep up that collaboration. Um, you know, there are three or four real centers of scientific innovation, United States, Europe, uh, and China. I would say if you add Japan to that, you've got about 80, 90 percent of the world's uh, productivity in uh, science. And we need every little bit of information, every little bit of progress we can get to help uh, confront what's turning out to be a far more difficult task, control of COVID. Absolutely. You asked me also about the, the work that we're thinking about doing, and I've come to the conclusion that no single modality is going to put the genie back in the bottle. Uh, vaccines are good, but some of the variants are breaking the vaccines, infecting and sickening people who've been doubly vaccinated, even with the very best vaccines. Public health control. You know, there's nobody who's done it better in China. Yet they're so busy at whacking the moles as they pop up from other places all over the world that even the best public health with rigorous identification, contact tracing, massive testing and isolation isn't controlling it in a way that makes life go back to normal. And then finally, with drugs, we know that prophylactic drugs, that is, if you're exposed, you will get the drug, will work and will protect you even if you're infected before you know it. But we have far too few of those. The only ones we have right now that work well are monoclonal antibodies. And unfortunately, when the virus becomes resistant to vaccines, it often becomes resistant to the monoclonal antibodies. We need a global, full-bore effort to do more research. Now, I'm a virologist, and I study these viruses in great detail. Uh, we've been very successful at controlling HIV, even though we don't have a vaccine. That's because we have pro prophylactic drugs. But it took us years and years of intense research. We in America, just in the government, spent uh, $3 billion a year. And our pharmaceutical industry spent it, it, it just as much for 35 years to get where we are today. 
We need to catch up. We need the whole world working together to create new ways to treat and prevent this disease. And we need better vaccines. The vaccines we have now, as good as they are, and they're as good as we've seen, fade over time and don't protect against all of the variants and the variants to come. So we really need global cooperation, global effort, and it has to be even more intense than it's been in the past. Doctor, here in the U.S., the Delta variant, as you know, uh, spreading like wildfire. It's really hitting a lot of these southern states, these red states, uh, as they're described here in the U.S. Uh, let's take Louisiana, for example. An epidemiologist there in Tulane University says it is mirroring what they saw in March of 2020. They're seeing a tenfold increase in just one month. How concerned should we be here in the U.S.? We have to be very concerned. When you see someplace like Florida or Louisiana with extraordinary numbers rising sky high, this thing is out of control. And it's not just the southern states, Oregon, for example. Now, one thing people don't realize about a lot of our western states is there are really two states, the coast and then the eastern part. You know, people think of California as a string bean. No, it's big and wide. And there are parts of California which resemble the culture of the Deep South. And in Oregon, in the Western Oregon, where there's a raging epidemic, the vaccination rates are approximately the same as those of Louisiana. But it's not just vaccination. We, ha as I say, we have to use all possible methods. We have to use vaccination. We have to use early treatments. We have to mask up and avoid large crowds. You know, I literally tear my hair, as little hair as I have, uh, over the mask mandate. The people who are not allowing people to protect themselves through mask mandates where appropriate are literally responsible for tens of thousands of people falling ill and many, many thousands of people dying. They are responsible. They should be held responsible for the death of their fellow citizens. A government's job is to protect us not to keep us exposed for political gain. It is horrifying for me to watch that in the United States and elsewhere around the world. You know, uh, you mentioned China. It's been very successful in its kind of whack-a-mole strategy as you described it. But as you know, there's uh, new cases cropping up in places like Nanjing. Um, this spread so quickly, often without any symptoms. So just looking at China, uh, what does that tell us uh, about just how difficult this is going to be to bring this thing under control? Well, if China's having problems, and they're the best in the world, I would say New Zealand, Australia, um, China are the best examples in the world of how public health keeps it under control. There are also excellent examples of how that's not enough. The virus keeps changing. COVID-2021 is not COVID-19. This is a much more difficult. I think the doctors in the U.S. now recognize it with the following mantra, younger quicker, deadlier. Younger, quicker, deadlier. It spreads much more rapidly. Chinese scientists are the ones who actually did the great measurements and showed that there's about 1,200 times as much virus. Let me tell you what that means. Suppose a mask protects you 99% from the first, the Wuhan strain. Well, that 1% turns into 10 times as much virus leaving if the vi you have 1,200 times more virus. So even wearing a mask to protect people against you and to prevent you from getting in isn't very effective. It's 10 times less effective than it was before. These are dangerous variants, and they're, they, they can get worse still. There's a new report out from the group in uh, Great Britain called SAGE, which is the advisory group to the government, which projects how much worse this can get. And in all respects, they say it's either a virtual certainty or highly likely it will become more transmissible, more lethal, and more likely to evade the immune response. But let's talk a little bit about Iceland. They've got 86% of the people 16 and above fully vaccinated, about 5% who are partially vaccinated. So huge numbers. Um, despite that, despite their best efforts at controlling uh, people coming in and out, having them tested, all of these sorts of things. And as you know, Iceland depends on tourism. They're starting to see an uptick in cases, which shows us the global pandemic. You can do everything you can within your own borders, but you're always going to be impacted by 
other countries and people coming from other countries. So this really kind of illustrates just how important it is that we get these vaccines all across the world, right? Well, it's not just the vaccines, and that's my whole point. It's multimodal. You know, what you've just described is a good example of vaccines not being enough. It, it shows that even if you vaccinate most of the people and you get new variants, you are in trouble, like Iceland's in trouble. That is, you know, if you look at Chile, you look at Israel, you look at the UK now, and you look at Iceland, you understand that what this virus is doing. I think the paradigm people have in their mind, it, which we all know is flu. We get vaccinated every year against flu, yet it comes back. Why is this different? This is very similar to that. If you think of this as as changeable and variable as the flu, but far more lethal than the flu, you'll have the right paradigm. So vaccination is not enough. This new Delta virus breaks through vaccines. Now, let me just run down vaccines for you. If you've been vaccinated, you have to know what vaccine you've gotten. Some vaccines work really well, like the Moderna and the Pfizer mRNA vaccines. And I know China is beginning to uh, build those vaccines themselves. The adenoviruses work less well. And there's a number of viruses, particularly some that are prevalent in China, that don't work virtually at all against Delta. That's a sad thing, but it's what you expect with these viruses. So the second thing is how long ago did you get it? Even if you got the very best vaccines, we know after 10 weeks, you're substantially less protected than you were before. The third is who you are. I'm of a certain age. I, make, I know that I have made one quarter the amount of antibodies against the virus when vaccinated that my daughters who are in their 20s did. So that's what happens. So you have to know about what vaccine, who you are, what the variants are, and how long ago were you vaccinated. All of those things figure into the equation. This is a moving target. And what you hear today may not be what you hear tomorrow, not because people aren't telling you the best information they have, but because the situation is changing. One other thing that's changing is the type of patients that are now entering these hospitals, uh, much younger than before, uh, some under 50. Talk to us about your concerns there. Well, you know, as I mentioned, the new mantra for doctors on the front line is younger, quicker, sicker. Younger, quicker, sicker. And when we talk about young, in Indonesia, those are very small children, three to five, were very, very ill and dying. So we're talking we're not just young adults, we're talking about kids as well. This is a worse virus and it can get worse still. So we have to protect our entire society. And I'm just waiting for the day when younger kids can get infected, I mean, can get vaccinated. We need them vaccinated so they get whatever protection we can offer. But we also need better vaccines and we need better drugs. So there's a lot we have to do. Given us a lot to think about, Dr. Hazeltine, as always, a pleasure chatting with you. A fountain of information, really appreciate it. Well, it's my pleasure. Thank you, Mike. And that is where we're going to leave it today. Thanks so much for joining us on another edition of The Heat.